talking about parables this morning, and I was thank you very much. Now, if you get hot, just there's another one back there. You can go sit over there. Talking about parables this morning, and, and Jesus taught by parables. Always taught by parables. And what is the beauty of a parable? The beauty of a parable is that it's an ancient method for transmitting truth and morals. It's a simple thing. It takes usually takes two things and puts them side by side in order to make a short one-point message. A parable uses commonly known uh, events or subjects that everybody would understand. It's uh, what I like to call the bottom shelf stuff. You know, when you ever been to a house at the store the other day and there was a, a little lady came around the corner, I mean, she was compact. I don't know if she was four six. And she was short and, and she said, oh, I'm so glad to see you. And I thought, do I know you? I, I said, well, I'm glad to see you too. She said, could you reach that for me? <laughs> then I understood my purpose for the day. <laughs> and so sure enough, I reached up and it was actually up there for her. Pulled down hand. She says, I'm so glad I have to do this every aisle. I have to get people to help me find things and reach things. Well, sometimes we have things that are above our reach, but parables, the parables of Jesus are what I call bottom shelf. They're down where everybody can reach them. Anybody can get them. These three guys down here this morning got it. We're going to get some too. Okay? And that's a parable. Look with me at Matthew chapter 13 if you want. And uh, I don't have any slides. I'm not a slide kind of guy, so you actually have to use your Bible. Matthew 13, or your phone, or your computer, or whatever you have there. Uh, or those of you that don't have a Bible, I guess you're working from memory. That was a bad joke. I'm going to have to laugh at that. That's an old pastor's guilt trip. That's what that is. It's like, well, if you don't have your Bible, you read you. Not true. The Word of God is living, active, powerful, sharper than a two edged sword. It goes into where we can't protect ourselves against it, run from the life that it brings us. So we tuck it in your hearts, that's good. Matthew chapter 13 says, On the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea, and great multitudes were gathered together to him, so that he got into a boat and sat. And the whole multitude stood on the shore. And then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, and then follows a parable. So we get the picture of Jesus, picture of Jesus, picture of Jesus, picture of Jesus picture of the lake and making sure the message is heard, but he's going to give them parables. He's going to give them some bottom shelf stuff that they can get. Now, verse 10 of the same chapter, <clears throat> this isn't the parable we're looking at. We're going to be in Luke 15 in just a moment. It says, And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? He answered and said to them, Because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them, it has not been given. For whoever has to him, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they are closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And that's talking to you this morning. You have eyes that see. You have ears that hear. You have a heart that perceives and understands. And when it grasps the truth of God's word, it turns in that direction. I commend you for that. If that was not true, you wouldn't be here this morning. You'd find some other wonderful place to be. Right? Okay. This is a wonderful place to be. But we can find some other wonderful places to be. Like out on a trail, cleaning, and dying of a cardiac arrest. <laughs> now that's a joke too. And uh, 
I, I should add to you this before I move any further. Thank you. I know that the one thing that saved my life was not paramedics, it was not nurses, it was not a helicopter ride, it was the prayers of the saints. My life was absolutely in your hands. And I know there were many of you here that knew the situation, was transferred to you, told you what was going on, and you prayed for us. That is what made the difference. God is the only one that can answer prayer. Nobody else can answer prayer. Do you realize that? We can pray, but he's the only one that can answer prayer. And when you pray, as Dick Eastman says, when you pray, something happens that would not happen if you didn't pray. So something happened. God responded to your pleas on our behalf, and we get to live through that and from it. And I thank you sincerely for taking time to lift us up in prayer and for feeling with us, sensing with us the need. I wouldn't be here without you. And we got messages from all around the world, people praying for us. And it was truly humbling to find out how many people were praying for us. We're here this morning and our eyes see and our ears can hear and our hearts can perceive and turn. And so this morning we want to talk about, well, let me, let me flip over here to uh, verse in the same chapter of Matthew, verse 34 and 35, where Jesus says all, or where it says, all these things Jesus spoke to the multitude in parables, and without a parable, he did not speak to them. I find that personally fascinating. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things kept secret from the foundation of the world. And to take it a little further, over in chapter 15, Verse 7, as Jesus is talking with the scribes and the Pharisees, <clears throat> he says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So parables have a, a marvelous purpose for being able to communicate truth on the bottom shelf to anybody that was willing to listen and respond. Also had the possibility of being like a slider and getting right by the scribes and the Pharisees who didn't really care. Now all of us could relate to this, I think. Some of you may be maybe more gracious than others, but if you've been in a conversation where somebody's talking to you and the whole time they're talking, you're thinking of what you're gonna say rather than really listening. You're thinking about, you're just waiting for them to take a breath so you can, hey, no, that's not how it is. You want to break in, you want to give them your thinking rather than hearing them. Have you ever done it? Yeah. This is like the scribes and Pharisees. They're just waiting for a chance to get in on Jesus any moment they could and say, wait, hey, that's not right. No, the Bible, where the scripture says, and we know it to be like this, <clears throat> and rebut. So the parables could slide right past that group because they weren't even hearing. Luke chapter 15. I'm going to talk this morning briefly about how God is pursuing you. God pursued you. God found you. You were the lost sheep. He, he hunted you down. Some call him the hound dog of heaven. He's like a pit bull. <laughs> you know, a pit bull, I guess they say, once he latches on, he got something to go, right? He's the hound dog of heaven. He's looking for us. God pursues a relationship of love with us, a loving relationship. And he wants it to be very real, and he wants it to be very personal. Now, how does that fit what we're doing here at the church? I understand you're eyes are thinking about this corner property and there's a kind of a search underway in our hearts about is that a part of the ministry and the future of Crestline First Baptist. That's a big step. That's a big decision. And God's challenge is to bring his family into agreement and demonstrate his will and purpose, yes or no. Why or why not? 
so that our hearts are at peace if we move forward or that we feel peace if we don't. That we understand that it's fitting and it's right in his eyes. It's not whether I want it or not. We drove through the little parking lot as we came in this morning from the fire-stricken area of Big Bear again. I mean, it seems like we're always on fire up there. <clears throat> and we, we parked there just a moment and thought, okay, it's not about what I want. I think it'd be great to be able to pull in there and have fellowship and drink coffee and meet people and have the community be a place uh, of refuge there as they come through. That would be nice. But is it what God wants? You're not going to cast a shadow over that and say, I don't think so. Your challenge, our challenge, is to pray and to know his loving relationship and be so close to him that when he speaks, we hear him. We want to be like the little sheep over the shoulders, close to hear his voice rejoicing over us. Luke 15, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, now he's speaking to all of them in response. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise, and there's the hinge word, likewise, the two things in the parable are going to be compared now. Likewise, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. I wrote down quick four points that I get out of this. One, God pursues relationship with and loves sinners. While at the same time, point number two, those who are self-justified create distance from his love and from his care. If you're self-justified, you don't need a savior. If you can save yourself, you don't need Jesus. The truth is we can't. But there are those that continue to try and push away and that's what they create is a distance. Point number three, repentance is the, issue, is the process that creates joy in heaven <clears throat> and restores relationship with the good shepherd. Repentance is key. I have my own point of view. This is extra biblical. You can throw me out of the church on this if you'd like. <laughs> I, I postulate that the reason there's such a party in heaven when one sinner comes home it's because the angels that have been watching over that person get a day off. <laughs> I mean, look at your life, right? Your life and how many times they had to intervene. Like, man, if, they, if he keeps this up, he's going to kill. Look, he's going off the edge. Quick, save him. And how many times those angels are just constantly watching over you? And so now you get a, hey, he's coming to heaven. He's, it doesn't matter. You can take a day off if he dies the day he's in. <laughs> well, that's extra biblical. Just, you know, so I, I live out there sometimes. That was point number three. And the fourth point that I wrote down for myself, I'm sharing it with you, is that being in a love relationship with Him helps me to see His will and to see it more clearly, enabling and empowering me or empowering us to participate more fully. The closer I am to him, the more in love with him I am, the, the more time I spend with him, talking, chatting, just sharing everything. Is that what we do with people whom we love? We just share our hearts, share our life. And so the more we do that with him, the closer we are to hearing his voice and when he says yes, we know it's yes. When he says no, we know we shouldn't. <clears throat> there you go. Get that chair out of the way. Oh, thank you.
Be a little fighting room there. All right. This is not a no parking zone. So God pursues relationships and loves sinners. Those that are self-justified create distance from God and His love. Repentance is the key that turns the switch in joy in heaven and restores relationship with the Good Shepherd. And four, being in a love relationship with Him helps me to see that His see His will more clearly, enabling and empowering me to participate more fully. Let's take another trip back through this parable. Can we do that just for a moment? Share a few insights. Then all the tax collectors and sinners, the Greek word hamartalos, is a sinner. Now, the definition is quite simple. A sinner is a person who decidedly walks on a wrong path. You made a decision. I'm walking on a wrong path. I'm making a choice today it's, uh, that takes care of me and myself and my own, and I'm going to go this way, my choice. But it's a wrong path. In uh, Isaiah 53, verse 6, a quick little verse that says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says this about you. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Most of us are familiar with Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have, he's talking about the, the Jews and the Gentiles, or the Jews and the Greeks. We have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that all are under sin. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There's none who does good, no, not one. Wow. Sounds like we're all in the same boat so far. And this boat is sinking. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 2, however, and I like the first part of Ephesians 2, 1, where it says, you were, that's the way you were. We all participated in sin. We all walked our own way. We were all hamartalos. We were decidedly walking a different path than God had planned for us. In 1 Peter 2, 25, Peter shares with us, where you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Tax collectors and sinners. Well, we're sinners. I don't know if any of you are tax collectors, <clears throat> um, but a tax collector, if you're unaware, in, the, in this period, was somebody nobody liked. They, they collected taxes from the Jews and paid it to the Romans. So the Jews saw them as traitors for selling them out and being a, a brother in the, in, in, and being a brother Hebrew and still serving the Roman government by collecting their taxes. And the Romans didn't trust them because they were doing the, doing the same thing. They saw them as being the, those people that would betray their own in order to, to take from them. So the tax collectors in the middle had no friends, really. But what they did have was money. 
And the reason was when they would pay me over here and I'd collect the tax, I didn't really turn it all in. So they're great at embezzling. And they have lots of money, but they have no friends. So who's listening to Jesus? The tax collectors and us, the hamartalos, the sinners. And we're eager to hear what Jesus has to say. But there's also another group in the room, the Pharisees and the scribes there. Now they kept the law impeccably. The Pharisees was that sect, the group that looked at the law, wrote the law, rewrote the law, uh, transcribed it, gave it to others, made sure everybody listened, everybody obeyed, had to keep every jot and tittle, as it says, every little dotted I and cross T. They had to make sure everybody was keeping all the law. Now the interesting thing is the Romans, Paul tells us no one could be saved by keeping the law. No one. But they were trying, and they were doing really well. At it. They were hard at it. And they're listening to Jesus, and they all they do is complain. Hey, what is this with this guy? He's always welcoming. He not only receives, but he welcomes sinners. Anybody glad about that? I'm glad about that. And so he begins to speak the parable to him. Some of them it's going to go right by. Others it's going to be so bottom shelf they're going to get it immediately. They're going to understand the end result is that God loves them enough to come and find them as the lost sheep. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doesn't leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? Luke chapter 19 verse 10 for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the purpose of Jesus' coming. That's why he came, to find you, to hunt you down, and to bring you home. And when he's found it, he lays it upon his shoulders rejoicing. Isaiah 40, verse 11, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and he will gently lead those that are with young. Sheep really are interesting creatures. And uh, after some of these points, if you feel like you should, just lean over to somebody and say, hey, hey, Amen. <laughs> because sheep are relatively, I, I don't like to use the S word in church, but they're kind of stupid. <clears throat> and truly, they're head down, interest in one thing, and that's that little tuft of grass right there, then the next one right there, and there's another one, that's going to be nice. And in 10 feet, they can be absolutely lost and not have a clue where they are. Imagine the 99, the 100 are actually coming in at night, and the shepherd is bringing them home, and he's one, and 53, and 77, 88, 99, oops. What happened to that one? What happened to you? <laughs> Was it distracted? Did it like along the way say, oh look, another little thing of grass right there. <clears throat> and stopped at you and then looked up and everybody was gone. If that was the case, that poor little critter's on its own because he doesn't even know which way to go. And men, I apologize for using the masculine. Could have been a female. Probably was. Probably was. <laughs> no, there's a defensive moment. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know. It's usually us that won't stop and ask for directions, right? <laughs> Ooh. Ooh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Or what if this little sheep just decided, now I know they're going in for the night, but I don't want to go. It's not really that dark. I'm just going to hang back, and then as they all go around that final rock, I'm scooting, I'm on my own. Some of you were like that, right? Some of us, we're the ones that said, you know what, I've had enough, I'm, I'm out of here. Thinking that we would evade the shepherd in some way, thinking that we would somehow get away with that moment, but his love is so compelling his desire for us to be in relationship with him, with him is so powerful. He's not going to let us get away with that. He's going to tuck the 99 in and come looking for us. 
because we should be looking for those in our community in the same way. I like the fact that he slips that little sheep over his shoulders. And to me, that's significant in knowing this. John chapter 10, Jesus said, he's the good shepherd, right? He's the good shepherd. He said he will go to the sheepfold, stand at the door, and the, the keeper of the gate will open the gate. Some of you have seen this happen, may know about it, but if you don't, let me share with you that he'll stand right at the gate and begin to call his sheep. And as he calls them, often by name, come on, Louie, <laughs> come on, Beth, the sheep, and a pen at night in Jerusalem, for example, or Bethlehem, might have hundreds of sheep in it for safekeeping overnight. And so everybody's sheep are all mixed up. It looks like a parking lot for sheep. Okay? They're all in there, they're all mixed up in different parking spaces. And they've been milling around all night, being in, talking to one another, getting to know one another. But in the morning, the gate opens, and the sheep, they don't have to worry, the sheep aren't going to run out. Nobody's going to be lost or get away in that moment. But the shepherd stands at the gate and begins to call out. And only the ones that know his voice will find their way through the rest and come out the gate. And they'll count them out. How many do you have? 100. 99? 100. Close the gate. Next shepherd would come after breakfast and say, I'm here, open the gate, start calling out. The sound of his voice. And only his sheep will find his way through the crowd and come out the gate. That was an amen electronically. <laughs> <clears throat> Shepherd drapes that sheep over his shoulders for a couple of reasons. One, he doesn't want to try and get him in at night. You know, we're late already. Come on, let's go this way. Come on. And scoot him in. He could just call him and leave, but he's already got him at once. So up here, over the shoulders, he's safe. I'm safe. I can move quicker. And all the way back, I'm rejoicing. I found you, I found you, I found you. And what's the little sheep getting? Another dose of voice. He's getting to know the shepherd's voice. Because evidently, just a, a couple hours ago, he was listening well. Hey, I love you. I missed you. Um, you know, you have a purpose. And it's not just mutton, you know, me. <laughs> Um, I'm going to shear you one day, and they're going to provide clothing for whole families. You've got a purpose in life, and I just want to show you that I'm watching out for your good. And I really didn't like the fact that you hung back and got lost. I mean, it would have been a lot easier for me just to stay with everybody there, but you're important to me. And right now, I just feel like crying because he said those things to me so many times and to you. He has expressed his love to you in so many many multitudinous <clears throat> moments of your life. And so we're like that sheep over his shoulders, one on one. Yeah, there's 99, yeah, there's 100. There's a lot of sheep in his kingdom. There's a lot of sheep in his fold. But what he wants is a loving relationship with you that is so personal, so individualized, so draped over the shoulders, talking into your little ear, that you will always know his voice. And can you imagine the power of a collective body like this, all knowing their master's voice? And then we say, let's join hands and pray on a topic like, should we or shouldn't we move forward with this property? And we all get to hear the same answer because it's the same shepherd. And there's no disagreement one way or the other. My personal desire might not be fulfilled, but that's okay. He's got another way to do that. Maybe I don't want to work in a coffee shop. We've got a great one in Bigger. You ever come over there and find it? It's called Amangelos. Two sister-in-laws uh, founded this one's name, Amangela, or Angela, and the other one's Amanda. So they call it Amangelos. And they have done a superior job. Uh, we, were, we stopped by there on the way out of town this morning, and the place was packed. Nothing else is going on in town, but that place is packed. Now, I don't know if those folks are getting ready to go to church or not, but 
they were experiencing a wonderful morning. And that, I see, could be a wonderful thing here, too. Mm -hmm. Let me make sure I finish through this. More joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Well, I think for us bottom shelf folks, probably wasn't hard to figure out who the 99 were in this parable. The ones who were opposing and criticizing and pushing away from relationship with the master. God's telling us, I'll rejoice more over this one who says, I need it, than over the rest of your self-justifying Pharisees and scribes. You need it too. And God wasn't saying you'll never get in. He was just saying, right now, you're not able to hear. You're not able to hear me. I'm teaching constantly. And you can't hear me. And I hold that against you. You need to bow your knee. You need to bring your heart into submission to the truth. But until then, I'll just keep teaching and I'll get the one every time. I shared my story here before where I was just a young kid doing drugs out on the streets. And, and uh, he sent two people to talk to me at Jack in the Box in the middle of Big Bear. And he hunted me down. He came to find me. I wasn't looking for him. I, did, I was searching for him. And I had questions about life as a teenager, as we all do. <clears throat> but he walked people right up to me and said, want to talk about Jesus? And I said, sure. And they gave me the answers I needed. And he sent those guys, like himself, as his representatives, shepherd, looking for the one in 99. And I'm so glad that day he found me. Because I wasn't ever probably going to find him on my own. You know, God made a statement in history. It started with, for us, John 3.16, which we know fairly well, I would think. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And whosoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, right? And the next verse, do we know the next verse? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 states this. This is the statement for me that is the, the dividing point of history when he said, God demonstrates his love toward us in this. While we were still hamartalos, while we were still decidedly walking in our own way, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now for us, this far down in history, maybe kind of hard to reconcile that couple of thousand years between then and now, but the truth is, he's eternal. He's not linear in time like we are. He sees it all at once. And so he knew on the day you needed salvation, on the day your sin separated you from him, that if Jesus would take your place on the cross, he could win the day and get you back. And so he demonstrated his love. Some have said, how much does God love me? How much do you love me? And he stretched out his arms and said, this much. Right? This is how much. I love you. I hope we can move this into a point in our thinking that says he doesn't just love everybody collectively. God so loved the world. It's always so much bigger than just me. No, he knows you as the one of the 99. Jeremiah 31.3 reaches from the prophets and says to us, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, have I drawn you? Jesus resounds this in Matthew, or John chapter 6, verse 44, where he says, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. What's the drawing point? His love. It's never like, I can't wait to get on your case. It's like, as soon as I get you over here, I'm going to spank you for all the bad things you did. I've got this big stick I'm going to whack you with because you're such a sinner. It's, that's not his motive. In fact, I heard this story of a shepherd. 
I really like this. The guy's in England where most, a lot more of that happens, right? So he's in England, he's riding one of those big tour buses and they're pointing things out. He looks out the window and there's this flock of sheep with a guy behind him tapping them like this and moving them along. He goes, something about everything in me says that's not right. So the tour bus stops at the next little place, and while they're there, this flock catches up to there. And so he says, excuse me from this group, he walks over to this guy, he says, hey, I'm having a conflict. I'm watching you move these uh, sheep down the road like this, and I want to know, <clears throat> I always thought the shepherd led the sheep. He goes, oh, they do. I'm a butcher. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is the good shepherd, not the good butcher. He says, I will lead. I will call them by name and they'll follow me. They know my voice. In fact, in John 10, he said, they will know my voice and they will not follow another. And we're tempted all the time to follow something else. Jesus said, they won't follow another. They know my voice. They know my will. They want to participate with me. Psalm 23 is the classic shepherd psalm, right? Most of you have it memorized, I'm sure. I know every time I turn to it, I begin to hear it in Spanish, which I think is exciting and beautiful. I like the phrase, nada me faltará. I shall not want. I lack nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Ye though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. I like the transition about he, 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 and then the psalm says you. Not somebody far off, but you, my relationship, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. If you ever get the chance, you find a book that says, uh, A Shepherd Looks at the Psalms. What a beautiful book. It takes each one of these and helps you understand from a shepherd's point of view why each of these lines is so important coming from the great psalmist of God, a shepherd himself, David. You know something else about sheep when they get lost? They'll just lay down. Now the problem with them laying down is that they'll find the deepest, greenest little patch of grass because it's the softest, right? As you would. <clears throat> The problem with that, the reason it's greener, all you horticulturists here, is because there's a dip in the soil and it's grown longer. And so it's padded. The little sheep says, man, that looks good. <laughs> and he lays down and he'll roll right over on his back in that dip and just stay there, kicking his legs. <laughs> You've heard the phrase, stewing in your own juice? <laughs> You've heard that, right? You know, just stew it in your own juice, man. Well, that's what the sheep will do. Their gastric system will literally cook them to death if they stay on their back very long. But they have no ability to get themselves upright on their own. Wow. Uh, I know this isn't a class about sheep this morning. In some ways it is. But look at us, how helpless we are. When we find that place in life, well, I'm going to be really comfortable here. This will be nice. Man, man, here. No one juice it. And the shepherd's going, okay, here we go again. 99, tuck you in. Where's Jeff? <laughs> uh, he's out there going, man, help me, help me, help me. And if he doesn't come to find you, 
I will die. If I'm just wandering, I'll never make it home unless it's an accident because I can't find my own way. Well, these are tough things to admit, aren't they? And we read these beautiful passages in the scripture about sheep and shepherds, and we feel all warm and fuzzy until we understand them. And we go, man, I really am an idiot. <laughs> I'll say that about me, maybe not you. But I can't find my way home. I'll die from stealing my own juices in my rebellion or my wandering. Whichever way it comes, if I'm distant from him, I'm in trouble. The beautiful part is he's pursuing a love relationship with me. He's looking for me constantly, individually, personally. He knows more about me than I know about me, and he loves me still. All of this to say, you are valuable to the Father. He has searched for you. You're loved by him, and it's demonstrated by him sending his son to die for you. He's desiring for you to love him in return. Isn't that a beautiful thing? As I said earlier, it's hugging Virgil. It's, it's nice to be loved. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to give love. We're all built for it. It's another insight that I've gained the last few years. I came to understand from neuroscience that we are predisposed at birth to be loving empathetic creatures and to build and sustain relationship. It's predisposed, built in, hardwired. But not all of us have that loving upbringing that supported it and developed it. Amen. Right? Some of us got abused, neglected, and all kinds of crazy. And so that part of us got broken. God is saying, I'm going to rewire it. I'll show you how to love. He's willing to leave the 99 every time and come to find you. Well, I suggest you don't get lost as often. 